Welcome to the annual Cruikshank Lecture at the University of Rhode Island. My name is Donnie Hayes. I'm the provost here at URI. It's my pleasure to welcome this full crowd of about 300 people. Uh, as many of you know, the Cruikshank Lecture started in 1999 here at the University of Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Each year hosts a premier scientist in one of three disciplines, biology, chemistry, or physics. We're very, very pleased this year to have Dr. Suskind with us. I don't get to introduce him, but he will do that in a few moments. But uh, it is our pleasure, sir, to have you on our campus, to have a world-class scientist, one of the lead leading scholars and thinkers in the area of physics and string theory, to share his, his view of the world with us uh, this evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight. This is a wonderful, wonderful turnout. I want to take a moment to give you a little bit of background on the Cruikshank Lecture Series. In fact, this is a series that was named and endowed in 1999 by the Board of Trustees of the Gordon Research Conferences. The Gordon Research Conferences, as many of you probably know, is one of the world premier conferences on science, really focused on bringing the leading scientists in the world together to discuss and debate the, the leading frontiers of science. The special thing about the Alexander Cruikshank Lecture is the University of Rhode Island has one every year. The Gordon Research Conference also has one every year, but has one somewhere in the world every year. We have one on our campus every year, and that's very, very special. And the reason we have one on our campus every year is because Alexander Cruikshank, who was affiliated with the Gordon Research Conferences for 47 years, for 47 years, was until his retirement in 1993 a professor of chemistry at the University of Rhode Island. Tonight is my pleasure to point out to you at the risk of embarrassing Dr. Cruikshank. He's here tonight, and I hope maybe he'll stand for just a moment so we can recognize his commitment and leadership to advancing science. Dr. Cruikshank, thank you for Before I turn it over to Dean Wendy Brownell of the College of Arts and Sciences, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the Department of Physics at the University of Rhode Island for organizing this session, and in particular Dr. Len Kahn, who I know put in extra time to get Dr. Suskind here and to organize this event. Thank you, Physics Department, for organizing this tonight. Of course, the other organizer and sponsor of this event tonight is the College of Arts and Sciences, the largest college at the University of Rhode Island. And to introduce our speaker tonight, I bring to the podium the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean Winnie Brownell. Thank you, Provost Hayes. May I say I'm thrilled to see so many students here tonight really terrific. Before I introduce our distinguished guest, I also wanted to express appreciation to Leonard Kahn of the Department of Physics and to Joanne Esposito, who has worked with us uh, to make this event, everything run smoothly. And I, I want to express my appreciation too to the Office of the Provost and the Office of the President for their roles. In addition to the Cruikshank Lecture tonight, I want to make sure you know that Dr. Suskind will also speak on eternal inflation and the cosmic landscape this Friday, October 12th, at the Physics Colloquium in East Hall at 4 p.m. If you want more information, I suggest you ask Dr. Khan afterwards. And now it is my honor to introduce Dr. Suskind. Dr. Leonard Suskind received his BS from the City College of New York and his PhD from Cornell University, where he also completed an NSF postdoc. He began his career at the Belfort Graduate School of Science at Yeshiva University, 
and went on to serve as a professor of physics at the University of Tel Aviv and continued his professorship at Yeshiva until 1979 when he moved to Stanford University where he is the Felix Block Professor of Physics and the director of the acclaimed Stanford Institute for Theoretical Physics. <coughs> Dr. Suskind, as probably most of you know, is known as the father of string theory. He's received prestigious awards for his brilliant work, including the Pregel Award from the New York Academy of Science, the J.J. Sakurai Prize in Theoretical Particle Physics, and served as the Loeb Lecturer at Harvard University. He works on string theory, as I mentioned, quantum field theory, quantum statistical mechanics, quantum cosmology, and more. He received the Los Angeles Times Book Award in Science and Technology for his wonderful book, The Black Hole War, My Battle with Stephen Hawking to Make the World Safe for Quantum Mechanics. <laughs> and you gotta love a man who has a <laughs> and one thing I wanted to say that I really admire of many things about Dr. Suskind, but that he can take elegant, complex ideas, and because he understands them so well, make them accessible to people who are not rock star physicists, geniuses. And I thank him for that. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Leonard Suskind. Thank you, Winnie. I thought you were going to say I'm known for taking elegant ideas and completely ruining them, but <laughs> <laughs> there are those who would say that. Okay. Ah. Hmm. I don't know what to do next. Quick, 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 quick. quick. Help, help, help. I once gave a lecture in uh, the Carter Center in Atlanta, and Jimmy Carter was there. It turns out he's a physics uh, wannabe. And um, <laughs> nobody knew how to start the machine. Nobody knew how to get it started. And we sat there and sat there. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for the tech person to figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And finally, Jimmy himself jumped up and he said, press F7. <laughs> 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 Okay, I always knew exactly why I was a Democrat. <laughs> the Black Hole War. The Black Hole War was not like Star Wars. It was not a war of uh, weapons. It was not a clash of civilization. Unless, of course, you think of um, quantum physicists and relativity physicists as different civilizations. But um, what it really was, was not a war between people at all. It was a war between principles, between principles of physics, fundamental principles of physics, both of which trace back to the same person, and of course, who could it possibly be? It was Albert Einstein, quantum mechanics, and the general theory of relativity. They clash, or they appear to clash. Things which are true can't clash, of course. You've got to make them consistent, but they can appear to clash. The principles of relativity and the principles of quantum mechanics looked like they were really in a head-to-head -head clash. There were champions, of course, uh, as, uh, was, as I'm sure there were. Anybody know what this is? I found this on the internet. I don't know what this picture is, but I'm guessing that it's the Battle of Megiddo. Looks to me like Megiddo. <laughs> but um, it was a clash. And it's largely been resolved. One side won and one side lost, but of course in some sense really both sides won because both sides learned something that they didn't know beforehand. Okay, as I said, it was a battle between two very, very fundamental sets of principles of physics. And so let me start with, with them, with one of them in any case. When you learn physics, you learn if you're a, a beginner, you learn that there's a first law and a second law and a third law. It doesn't matter whether it's thermodynamics or Newtonian mechanics. There's always a first law, a second law, and a third law. But then when people think harder, 
they realize that they forgot something that was even more important than the first three laws, and they tend to call it the zeroth law. There is a zeroth law of thermodynamics, and I've also heard people talk about a zeroth law of mechanics. I won't tell you what it is. But there was a law which is so much more fundamental than any of the others that people always forget about it when teaching physics. They always forget about it because it's so deeply embedded in their mind that they tend to completely forget it. So when I started writing about this law and thinking about it, I needed to give it a name. I tend to call it to my students and to, uh, to people around me the minus first law of physics. Um, hopefully, it's someday somebody will fill, figure out the, the minus second law of physics, but the minus first law of physics is the law that information is never lost. What does it mean? It means that distinctions between things, distinctions between starting points, differences in the starting points of physical systems as they evolve, as they change, are never really lost. They're permanently frozen in. Now, information, you don't really need for this lecture to know a technical definition of information. It's just that which characterizes a physical system. Whatever you need to know in order to, uh, to understand what a system is going to do, whatever that system is, and information, particularly in quantum mechanics, comes in bits. Bit is a unit. It's an actual unit. It's the same unit that you use in a computer. A switch on, off is a bit. A heads or a tail is a bit. And information comes in bits. In particular, for example, a Morse code message is sent in a series of bits. So here's a bit of information. I read this once in the encyclopedia. King Canute had warts on his chin. That's a bit of information. It's, a, it's more than a bit of information. It's a collection of bits of information. And you could quantify how many bits of information in many, many ways. But in particular, you could write the message out in Morse code and then count up the number of dots and dashes that you have to write down. And you could say that this is, I forget how many bits there, a 52-bit message, I don't remember. Some number of bits in this message. And you don't ever have to know what the message means to know that this message contains 52 bits of information. Now, the minus first law of physics is that bits are in some sense forever. They're never lost. I'll give you an example. An example comes from computer science. If I put into my computer the message in the form of some switches and some bits, uh, however they're put in, they're in the computer. Now, I want to erase something in my computer. You have to erase things, otherwise your computer will fill up with uh, too much stuff. So you try to erase a bit of information, and you think you've gotten lost, you've lost it. In fact, that bit of information has been ejected out of the computer into the environment where in practice you cannot recover it. It's just too hard. It's mixed up with too many molecules of air and so forth. But that information is never really lost. It is really stored in some very, very complex way in the motion of all the molecules and so forth. Uh, and that's the sense in which information is never lost. It's always there, even though it may be impossibly hard to recover. That's the principle that I call the minus first law. Now, Stephen Hawking at one point challenged that principle. This was not a small thing to challenge. This is deeply, deeply embedded in the structure of all physical theories that information is conserved, that information is preserved. And what Stephen said is, no. If you have a black hole, this is a black hole, it's, a, it's not a real black hole, nobody photographed a black hole up close like that. Uh, well, you know, you could send a rocket out and take a picture of a black hole and bring it back, it probably would look something like that. Uh, he said if you had a black hole and you threw information into it, for example, the message that I had before written down, you throw it in, it's gone. It's gone from the world, it falls into the black hole, Nothing can ever get out of a black hole. It is gone. That was basically challenging the minus first law of physics. That was a very insightful thing to realize that that question existed, but it took about 20 years or 25 years or something like that, and that was the black hole war. 
in which people, myself in particular, Gerard Hooft, other physicists, challenged the challenge and said, no, Stephen, you must be wrong, but we couldn't figure out why. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with what, what Stephen was saying. We'll come to what Stephen was saying, but, uh, but um, couldn't figure out what was wrong. Eventually, I think we did figure out what was wrong. And roughly about eight years ago or something like that, we more or less all, not more or less, we all agreed. Stephen agreed. He had been wrong in the first place, but he had been wrong in a very, very insightful way. And so I will explain to you what we learned by taking up Stephen's challenge. So the question is, are the bits of information that fall into a black hole completely lost to the outside world, or do they somehow come out of the black hole eventually? Stephen said, yes, they're lost. They're definitely lost. And the only other two physicists for quite a while who took up this question were myself and I don't know how many of you recognize the gentleman next to me. I assume you can tell which one is me. <laughs> Incidentally, this was not taken at the time that Stephen issued his challenge. That was 1976. I was a younger man at the time. Uh, the person next to me is a very, very famous physicist, one of the really, truly great physicists of my generation, Harald Hooft. Now, are there any Dutchmen in the audience here? Not a single Dutch person? Yeah, can you please say Harad or Huf, uh, Huft for me? Oh, you're not from the Netherlands. <laughs> okay, so you'll have to accept my pronunciation, Harad <laughs> Huft. And Harad <laughs> Huft. And I said, no, Stephen, you must be wrong. Information cannot be lost. After all, it is the minus first law. But we couldn't figure out why. It took a long time. So let me begin with giving you a course in black hole physics. Now, of course, I can't give you a course in black hole physics in five minutes, so I have to use analogies. I'm using what is a reasonably close analogy, a reasonably close metaphor for what a black hole is. Uh, somebody was going to give me a laser pointer. Did the, the, no? Ah, you see it? Yeah, there it is. OK. So what I want you to imagine is an infinite lake, a lake which extends this confuses me. Why are there two of them? All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, bi that's biologists for you. <laughs> Incidentally, no physicist in their right mind would have designed a room like this with the screen out far from where the lecturer can, uh, can see it. That's insane. Only a biologist would do that. <laughs> so I'm forced to stand out here. Look, all right, so we have this big, big lake that goes on and on forever, but it's not very deep. It's only a foot or two deep, let's say two feet deep. And it's full of fish that, uh, that uh, move around in the lake. Uh, one of them is Alice. I think that one's Alice. This one's Bob. This one's Charlie, and so forth. And somewhere in the middle of the lake, now infinite lakes don't have middles, but, uh, but let's say somewhere in the lake, there's a drain hole. The rocks uh, underneath the lake have a fracture in them, and out through the drain hole, the water dumps down onto the rocks below. Okay? Now, if you think about drain holes, just ordinary drain holes, you'll realize that when you're very far from the drain hole, the fluid moves very slowly toward the drain hole. The further away you are, the slower the motion. As you get closer, the fluid flows faster and faster and faster. Okay? At some point, in this particular drain hole, you would need a powerful suction underneath in order to really make this happen. But at some point, there may be a place where the fluid is flowing in faster than the speed of sound. Imagine that, that the fluid was being sucked out so rapidly that at some point it was moving faster than the speed of sound. Now, there's also a law in this world. All right? It doesn't matter whether it's a man-made law, or a fish-made law, or a law of nature. But the law is the fish are not allowed to move faster than the speed of sound. Now, you all know, of course, I'm talking about the speed of light, but, uh, but let's call it the speed of sound. And therefore, that presents a problem. That presents a big problem to any fish, in particular Alice, who falls past that point. She has effectively fallen past the point of no return. She cannot outswim the current. She's doomed. 
She ha nothing has happened to her yet when she passes that point. That place is not special as far as she's, you know, she's floating down the river, or she's floating down. She feels nothing at that point of no return, but once she passes it, she is doomed. The next thing that will happen to her is she will land on the rocks below. So she tries to yell to her friend Bob, help, Bob, help, I'm, uh, I'm uh, falling into the black hole. But what happens? Because the fluid is moving faster than the speed of sound, not only can't Alice get out, but her sound can't get out. Her very words that she tries to issue also fall into the black hole. There is no way that she can uh, communicate with the outside. That, in effect, is what a black hole is. Substitute for sound, light. Substitute for this point of no return, substitute, what, what would you call it, that point? Horizon. The horizon of the black hole. That's the horizon of the black hole. And the rocks below, you want to guess what that's called? The singularity, the singularity. That's where Alice is really in trouble. But the main point here is that the horizon of the black hole is nothing but a point of no return, and in itself, it is not a dangerous place where Alice will get harmed by the black hole. Or so I say at the moment. Here's another picture of the same thing. I took this one off the internet without the fish and put the fish in. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, and uh, there's, I, I like my own pictures better, don't you? Yeah, okay. Uh, there's the horizon again. There's Alice. Well, no, this is Bob. And here's poor Alice. Okay. That's the theory of black holes in a nutshell. Now, in 1972, a physicist, a graduate student at Princeton University by the name of Jacob Beckenstein, discovered something very, very important about black holes, something that was quite remarkable, and at first, which people didn't believe. People really didn't believe him. Eventually, they realized he was right. That's the way it is with all good ideas. People at first think they're nonsense, and then they eventually understand them. In 1972, Beckenstein discovered that black holes have entropy. All right, so we have to talk about what entropy is. We have, you know, people talk about entropy, uh, poets talk about entropy, uh, all sorts of people talk about entropy. None of them mean by entropy the thing that a physicist really means by entropy. First of all, entropy means heat. But that's secondary. That's secondary. More important is that entropy is hidden information. So let's take a bathtub full of hot water. Here's a bathtub full of hot water. Uh, to describe that bathtub, you know, I, I want to know, should I take a bath in it or shall I not take a bath in it? So what I really want to know is how hot the water is, what the temperature of the water is. I might like to know how deep the water is. There's a few pieces of information that are important to me. Not very much. I may also want to know that what's made of water and not the sulfuric acid. But uh, just a handful of things to know about the water that I need to know. On the other hand, there's a vast amount of hidden information. What is that hidden information? That hidden information, for example, just as an example, is the position and velocity of every single molecule in that bath of water. It's hidden. Why is it hidden? It's hidden because the molecules are too small and too numerous to keep track of. And so that bathtub is filled with tiny, tiny bits of information too small and too numerous to keep track of. It's hidden information. That is what entropy is. Entropy is hidden information. The second law of thermodynamics says that information continuously becomes hidden. Things heat up, you lose track of them, and information that you was perfectly plain to begin with, just as the bit of information that came out of the computer disappears into the environment. That's what the second law says. It doesn't say information is disappears. It says it becomes harder and harder to keep track of. All right, so that's the idea of entropy. Let's ask how much entropy the, the bathtub can hold. Now, I'm not going to make a theory of entropy. It basically, roughly speaking, it's the number of atoms in the bathtub. How might we do an experiment to find out how many atoms fill up the bathtub? Well, I'll give you a very dumb way. 
we can just start dripping water into the bathtub atom by atom or drop by drop, let's say atom by atom, and we can simply count the number of drops that it takes to fill the bathtub. Of course, the answer we know to begin with, it's basically the volume of the bathtub measured in atomic units. That's all it is. It's the volume of the bathtub, and so we learn a lesson that the amount of hidden information, in this case, the number of drops or the number of atoms uh, that fall into the bathtub, is proportional to the volume of the bathtub. What was it that Bekenstein did? Bekenstein did the same experiment in his head with black holes. He asked, how many bits of information does it take? You start with a tiny, tiny black hole, maybe even a, the tiniest black hole that you can imagine, and you start dropping stuff into it. In the process of dropping stuff into it, the black hole grows. You drop energy into it, energy causes the black hole to grow, and you simply ask how many droplets, how many bits of information, how many particles do you have to drop into that black hole in order to create a large black hole, a black hole of the kind that you might really be interested in, not this tiny thing. So you drop an atom in. What happened? Not an atom. You drop a particle, a photon, let's say, into the black hole. And what does it do? It increases the size of the black hole puts energy into the black hole, the more energy you put in, the more it grows. You keep doing it, you keep doing it, you keep doing it. I wonder how many of these I put in. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I should count them and then I would know. What he discovered, which was quite remarkable and surprising, is that the information, the amount of bits, the amount of particles that have to be dropped into the black hole in order to give it a certain size is not proportional to the volume inside the black hole. He discovered that it's proportional to the area of the black hole, the area of the horizon. The area of the horizon, that surface that's the point of no return, that surface has a certain area, and the amount of information, the amount of hidden information inside the black hole is proportional to the area. It was as if the black hole was coated with little bits of information the surface of it coded, and that uh, the keeping track of information had something to do with the area of the horizon, not the volume. That was a shock, incidentally. That was a surprise, and in fact, it was a surprise to the extent where nobody, including Stephen Hawking, believed it at first. Okay, in addition, what I told you earlier is that entropy always means heat. That's a principle of thermodynamics. Whenever you add entropy, you heat a system. And that, in fact, told us that the horizon of a black hole, the place where all this entropy is stored, must be hot. It must be a hot, complicated, boiling, superheated collection of bits. What those bits were and exactly what they were composed of, of course, nobody, including Bekenstein, knew. String theorists have developed an idea of what those bits are. They're bits of string, so I'll go very quickly through. This is not important for the argument today, but I'll just tell you what we know or what we think we know. In string theory, all matter is made up of strings, little closed loops of one-dimensional energy. The more you heat a string, the more you increase its energy, the longer it grows. It's like taking a rubber band and, he and pumping energy into the rubber band. What happens to the rubber band when you pump energy into it? It grows, it stretches, it fluctuates, and it gets bigger and bigger until it snaps. But these, these things don't snap. And so if you take a little particle made out of a little bit of string and somehow pump energy into it, it will get bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more complex. That complexity is kind of hidden information. It gets so tangled up that nobody can keep track of it it becomes entropy, and eventually it grows to the point where gravity pulls it together and pulls it together into a black hole. That string is still present on the black hole, and it looks something like this. This is an artist's rendition of, a, of what a black hole might look like if you had a, a microscope that could see down to those tiny, tiny bits of information on the surface of the black hole. And, that became 
to some extent, the current theory of what goes on on the surface of a black hole. So, is the horizon a roiling, boiling, dangerous, hot sea of bits? Or, now go back a few steps. Earlier I said that the horizon was nothing but a point of no return. Nothing very dramatic happened to Alice when she floated past the horizon or past the point of no return. There's a conflict here. A conflict, quantum mechanics, entropy, Bekenstein concluded correctly, I believe, that the horizon of the black hole is this roiling, boiling mess of hot bits where I don't think Alice wants to go, on the other, on the other hand. But on the other hand, the theory of black holes a la Einstein or a la general relativity seemed to indicate that the black hole horizon is a point of no return, but nothing worse. This was a real conflict. Let's see, do I, did I, you yeah, know, I had another picture, darn it, I had another picture, and in the other picture, Alice falls into the black hole and experiences nothing, just falls in without anything happening to her. This is supposedly a picture of Alice falling into a black hole and discovering that the surface is full of extremely hot bits, those bits boiling, not boiling, much, much hotter than boiling, but so hot that they just burn up Alice and in the process just emit Alice back as smoke and vapor and photons and so forth. Two distinctly different theories of what happens. Alice falls through, nothing happens to her until later when she hits the singularity, or Alice burns up. Okay. Ah, I think we come to the next picture. Just a moment. Yeah, there it is. There's Alice falling in. Right. Does she burn up or does she fall in? To make things even more confusing, to make things even more confusing, black holes evaporate. This was the great discovery of Stephen Hawking. This was the great discovery that Stephen Hawking is justly famous for. He discovered that black holes evaporate. Now, I'm not going to tell you how he discovered that. It's not important to the story how he discovered that, but let's just, uh, let's just proceed assuming. And here's what happens. The black hole emits particles. The particles are photons and other kinds of particles. Those particles travel outward. They carry off energy. And in the process of carrying off energy, the black hole shrinks. It loses energy and it shrinks. It evaporates, just like a puddle of water that's evaporating. And this keeps going on and on and on until the black hole disappears. But when the black hole disappears, remember Alice who fell into the black hole. Alice was carrying bits of information. There was information stored in Alice's DNA, all sorts of information that she might have had. What happened to it? If information is never lost, what happened when the black hole evaporated? Alice was inside the black hole. She couldn't get out because the black holes you cannot escape from. And on the other hand, all that's left over in the end is radiation. Something wrong. Which is it? Alice burns up at the horizon. Alice sails freely through. And this question, pretty much as I phrased it, is the way it was phrased by Hawking. What is the answer? Let's go back a step. The answer is that both are true. Now that's absurd. How on earth can both be true? Surely we can do some experiment to tell what, which one is true. The answer is you can't do an experiment to tell which one is true. The reason is simple, uh, simply this. Here's the way the argument goes. Supposing Alice really does fall through the horizon and gets to the other side perfectly happy and yells out to Bob, I'm happy, everything's okay. Remember the fish, remember Alice the fish who fell through the horizon and tried to call Bob. What happened to his sound waves? They fell back into the black hole. The same thing happens not only with Alice's sound waves but with Alice's light waves. They're simply sucked back into the black hole and there is no operational way that she can signal to Bob that she's okay. Because there's no operational way, physicists start to wonder, is it possible that somehow it's possible that both Alice falls through the black hole and experiences nothing special, and yet Bob on the outside 
sees her burn up and be emitted among these photons which are emitted. That was a very puzzling situation. And I'm going to try to resolve it for you, but before I do, I have to tell you some more about information. Earlier, I gave you an example, the bathtub, where the amount of information that can be held in the bathtub is proportional to its volume. This is another example. This was uh, my, uh, my imaginary picture of the, um, of the library in Alexandria, Ptolemy's Library in Alexandria. If you go back to the historical uh, record, you find out it's about this, I forgot what the units are, I think meters, 200 meters by uh, something by something, 40 meters by, what is it, uh, 100 meters. That's about how big it was. And if you ask how much information it could store, the answer was you'd pretty much fill it up with about, I think uh, it was 50,000 scrolls. If you calculate how many bits there are in a scroll, I forget what it is, about 100,000 or something like that, and you can work out a, a billion bits of information could be stored in the library of Alexandria. But a scroll is not a very dense collection of information. Surely you can squeeze the, uh, the information down into um, a microchips or even smaller. You can squeeze the same amount of information. In fact, it's believed by physicists that the smallest unit of space is called the Planck length. This is not something I'm going to try to explain to you now, but the Planck length, I can't see that thing. These biologists are really screwed up. Yeah, yeah. The Planck length. The Planck length, a little cube the size of the Planck length. The Planck length is about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. It's tiny. It's smaller than anything known in ordinary nature. If each little bit occupied about a cubic Planck length, then you would discover that this library is capable of holding about 10 to the 108, 10 to the 108 bits. Now, 108 is not a very big number, but 10 to the 108 is a very, very big number. That's more than all of the particles in the whole observable universe. So if you squeeze them down to Planck size, you can get a lot of them in there. But supposing there was a law, again, it doesn't matter whether it's a man-made law at this point or whether it's a law of nature, Supposing there was a law, Ptolemy's law. Ptolemy issues a law and it says, you're not allowed to put information inside. You've got to put it where people can see it from the outside. He was worried about conspiracies. He didn't want conspiracies to take place in his library. So he said, the only way you're allowed to keep information in this library is to plaster it on the outside where everybody can see it. Okay. Well, obviously, a lot less information can be stored in this library. But let's allow the possibility that a bit of information can be stored not in a Planck volume, but in a Planck area, a little square area about the size. And now imagining plastering or wallpapering, I guess the right word, wallpapering the library with bits of information, each about a Planck unit on the side. How many can you get in then? Well, the answer is a mere 10 to the 72 instead of 10 to the 108. That's just because areas of regions tend to be smaller than volumes, surface, volumes, uh, surface to volume ratio. And so Ptolemy's library would only be able to store 10 to the 72 bits. That's still a big number, but much smaller than the first number. Well, it seems that there's a law of physics which goes like that that you cannot store information more than a certain amount, and the amount is the amount that you can plaster on the surface of a black hole. All right, so let's talk a little more about information and its representation either two-dimensionally on surfaces or three-dimensionally. Let me start. This is, a, this is a Rembrandt painting. It's called The Anatomy Lesson. And what it's going to do for us is it's going to be a lesson about something else. It's going to be a lesson about the storage of information in two dimensions instead of three dimensions. The question is something like this. Can you store real three-dimensional information in two -dimensional, on a two-dimensional picture, let's say? All right, so here it looks like uh, Rembrandt succeeded very admirably in storing the full three-dimensionality, storing meaning representing the full three-dimensionality. This looks awfully darn three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface, but of course it's an illusion. It's an illusion. It's an illusion that you, you use all sorts of neural circuits in your head to reconstruct things which aren't there. For example, behind this tall man's head, there's a, uh, there's a, um, 
a written document posted on the wall here. If this were really three-dimensional, I can't see what's written in a written document, but if it was really a three-dimensional thing, I would walk over to the side here and take a look. But I don't see any more by walking over to the side. This cadaver here looks awfully short, but it's impossible to tell from the picture whether he's short or foreshortened. Foreshortened just means he's being looked at from a direction which makes him look shorter. The information, the three-dimensional information, is really not there. It's, you, you've supplied it for, uh, from, uh, from your head. The information is not there. This is two-dimensional information. It is not three-dimensional information. So we might say that that picture can be stored in a computer, for example, in terms of, or not in a picture, just in a picture, in terms of pixels. We take a two-dimensional surface, we color the pixels with either black and white, let it be a black and white picture, little dots, and we can store that entire picture, but we are not really storing three-dimensional information, we're storing two-dimensional information. This is pixels. Supposing we really want to store in a similar way three-dimensional information, then what we do is we build a box. And we construct it not out of pixels, but what are called voxels. Voxels are little three-dimensional versions of the pixel. And we color those three-dimensional boxes. There's things inside there. I couldn't draw them on a picture, of course. Things inside there. And that, of course, can store three-dimensional information. It is three-dimensional information. It can store, it uh, can tell you what's behind what and so forth. So you might think that it really is not possible to represent a real three-dimensional figure in a two-dimensional pixelated way. But that's, in fact, false. This is a picture of a piece of film that forms a hologram. This is a holographic film. Now, it isn't really. I made this up myself. I could not find a good image of a piece of holographic film. But this is roughly what it would look like. This represents something. This represents a three-dimensional figure. You've all seen holograms. Holograms, you walk around them, you can look behind them. And in fact, a hologram that could be made from, a, um, uh, from an uh, MRI scan could actually have the full three-dimensional representation of a human body in the form of two-dimensional coding like this. The cost is that the coding is very, very scrambled. The three-dimensional representation, the three-dimensional figure that's stored in here is stored in an impossibly scrambled way, and only if you know the code can you decode it and find out what it says. Well, the code for an ordinary hologram is rather simple. You shine light on the hologram, and an image appears. A full three-dimensional image appears, and you can walk around it. You can look at it from the sides. If you want to know whether this clown here really has hair on the back of his head, you can take a look. As I said, if the image was made from an MRI scan, you could even look into the interior of it and see that uh, the clown, whether the clown had blood and guts and all that sort of stuff. So holograms are two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional information. The lesson that we've learned over the last 20 years of, and so forth is that the relationship between the surface of the black hole, which is this scrambled collection of tiny bits plastered or wallpapered over the horizon of the black hole, and Alice on the interior, is the, basically the relationship between holographic film and image created representing the same information that's on the holographic surface. In other words, the horizon of a black hole is kind of like a hologram. It stores information in a horribly scrambled way. Bob can only see the outer part of the, uh, can only see the horizon, the boundary of the uh, black hole. And he says, oh my god, Alice has been scrambled and turned into a horrible mess. But no. That's not what Alice says. Alice says, I'm OK. So that is a basic lesson that we've learned time and time again from the quantum mechanics, from the string theory, from general relativity, from a variety of things to put them all together. 
we've learned that the horizon of a black hole is like a hologram. Two representations of the same thing, the hologram and Alice. But we've learned more than that. We've learned not only is the interior of a black hole a hologram, it appears that if we follow the logic, the whole universe can be thought of as a kind of hologram, a math mathematically represented. Now this is my favorite picture, my favorite astronomical picture of the universe. Um, a little bit unrealistic, but nevertheless pretty, so I like it. It's a pretty representation of the universe. It's three-dimensional. It's got uh, all sorts of three-dimensional things. And what we've learned is that the universe is, in a sense, a sense to be specified, a hologram. All of the information in the universe can be stored on its boundary as a kind of holographic image. Okay, now how on earth did we ever come to such a conclusion? And I'm going to tell you the very simple argument. It's really, really simple. Imagine a region of space that contains all kinds of stuff, hidden and unhidden information, scrambled, unscrambled. What do I have there? I've forgotten now. A glass of wine and a piece of cheese and a bunch of uh, scrambled information. And it's in some region bounded by a sphere here. The question is how much information, how many bits of information can you keep track of or how many can you store inside that sphere? And here's the way the argument goes. First of all, imagine a shell of material around the region, a shell of heavy material. And now imagine compressing that material, compressing it until it is just big enough to form a black hole. If you take material and you compress it, it will eventually form a black hole. And if you choose the amount of material correctly, you can make it so that the black hole just barely fills the region of space that you started with. Okay. Well, where is the stuff that was in there, the bits of information? The answer is they must be plastered on the horizon. There's hidden information in there on the horizon of that black hole. How much hidden information? You might think the volume, but no, Bekenstein told us that the information stored in a black hole is its area. And so we learn from this argument that the maximum amount of information that is possible in a region of space is the area of the black is the area of that region of space. In other words, a region of space and the things in it are like the hologram described by a surface composed of little bits of information. You cannot squeeze more in, and therefore a mathematical description of the universe or that portion of the universe must be possible in terms of the boundary of the region. Now that was a crazy idea. That was the idea that it hoofed and I, and I put forward sometime around 1993. And it was considered nuts by the physics community. Largely, the physics community said, well, those two guys used to be very good physicists, but they've lost their marbles. <laughs> uh, that was with the exception of a few people, one of whom was, this is Edward Witten, the great mathematician and uh, physicist, and this is Juan Maldacena, another great physicist, both of them in Princeton, and they realized that there really was something to this idea and they made it very, very sharp. I'm not going to tell you how they made it sharp, but they put real, honest, exact mathematics into it. They discovered a perfect example of this, and once these people had found this perfect example, it's called anti de Sitter space, it doesn't matter what it is, it was highly mathematical, it was very precise. Once they found it, everything fell into line. All physicists who had any sense at all said, Yes, this holographic idea is correct. It is now considered basically a law of physics that, uh, that a region of space can be completely described by a set of degrees of freedom plastered on, in some sense, attached to the boundary of the region of space. One bit of information per Planck area. It's known as the holographic principle, and you can find literally tens of thousands of papers since that time on the holographic principle, using it in all sorts of ways. Once these ideas took root, it was pretty clear that the information that falls into a black hole 
is not completely lost. Is not completely lost. Instead, it is stored on the surface of the black hole. And then, as the black hole evaporates, it's emitted out into the radiation, just like the little bit of information that was ejected from the computer. It's there, very hard to reconstruct, and it's kind of the evaporation product of this piece of film on the outside. Once that became clear, everybody began to agree. Stephen understood that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that not that he had made a mistake. It would be wrong to call what Stephen said a mistake. Uh, it was, <laughs> if it was a mistake, it was an incredibly seminal mistake. But he understood that, yes, it was true that uh, information is not lost when it falls into a black hole. It's stored on the surface, and it's emitted. And we all agreed. That's the status of it now, that uh, the black hole war is over in that sense. Everybody agrees. Information is not lost. It was a very powerful thing to learn. This is a uh, picture of a bet that was made sometime around 1993, not between myself and Stephen Hawking, but with a physicist by the name of Don Page. It was a bet, a contract of a bet. Don Page had bet them that information is not lost. Stephen bet that it was lost. And in this document here, this is Stephen's thumbprint over here. Of course, somebody had to hold his thumb and push it onto the paper, so there's some question of conspiracy here. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, April 2007, Stephen conceded, and uh, an armistice was signed, and this is the armistice paper here. That, uh, that This is probably worth some money, isn't it? I don't have the original document, Don Page, but I'm going to try to get it from Don Page before I tell him what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> okay, that, in fact, was the end of the story until about two and a half months ago, when a new wrinkle showed up. And the new wrinkle was in this paper here. Don't worry about what the title means. Well, you know what black holes mean. Complementarity of firewalls. In fact, this is exactly the same question. Does Alice burn up when she goes to the horizon, or doesn't she burn up? What, incidentally, at least, well, the, um, two of these people are graduate students, Sully and uh, Almeri. Polchinski, they, Joseph Polchinski, is one of the great physicists in the world. He's one of the leading, uh, for many years now, he's been one of the great theorists, particle theory, string theory, gravity, all kinds of important theoretical developments he has made. And Don Marolf is also a very senior general relativity expert. And they started thinking more about this issue, and they realized something interesting, something quite interesting, or at least they argue something interesting. I'm going to translate now what they said in a way that they might not completely approve of, but, but I, I actually I think they would. But what they discovered, and now it's contentious, it's not clear yet, this is really cutting edge frontline question, they maintain, and I think correctly, that the surface of black holes deteriorates with time. This wonderful hologram, which is built, incidentally, this hologram, these little dots and dashes and all that sort of stuff here, these are interference patterns. And every little piece of this contains a kind of fuzzy image of the whole three-dimensional region. A little piece of it will contain a fuzzy re of, uh, image. More of it will contain the same thing except clearer. The whole film will contain a very clear image of it. But it's very important that the quality of the film, the quality of the, let's call it the quality of the film, be precise enough that it can encode this description microscopically without too many mistakes. What they realized was as the black hole evaporates, it is as though little bits of this were emitted into the atmosphere or into the rest of the world. As it evaporates, the quality of the film degrades. The precision and the perfection of the 
lines, the little dots and dashes degrades, and it degrades as a consequence of emitting radiation. Until eventually, after a sufficient amount of time, I will tell you how much time in a little while, after enough time, it just becomes white noise. When it's white noise, it can contain no information inside. The hologram has been ruined. It's been ruined by aging, by aging and by evaporating and all of these little microscopic processes. And the interior of the black hole no longer, or the, or the, um, the uh, hologram, no longer, the holographic film no longer has the capacity to describe three-dimensional stuff in there. So instead, white noise and not so much emptiness, but just no capacity to describe anything on the interior. The interior of the black hole has been destroyed. At least that's what Polchinski and his friends maintain. Well, they go on to say what this means is that, in fact, that Alice, as she falls into the black hole, after this process has happened, after the film has deteriorated, at that point, once that has happened, Alice does not encounter nothing more complicated than a point of return, no return. She encounters what they call the firewall. A firewall is not really a hot place. It is simply the end of space. What they maintain, I believe correctly, is that the interior of the black hole, there is nothing there and nothing that can ever be there. Alice, in falling in, simply is terminated. Now, we don't know with certainty whether this is right yet, but Alice, as she falls in and crosses the horizon, is simply terminated. There is no space there. The black hole evaporates, that's true. Alice's bits do get out, but they never enter. They never enter the black hole. That is for a black hole which is old enough to have deteriorated, old enough that the holographic precision has been destroyed simply by aging. How old is that? For a solar mass black hole, I think it was 10 to the 72 years. 10 to the 72 years is many, 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 many times bigger than the age of the universe. It's a very, very long time, much longer than any astronomical or cosmological uh, observations that have ever been done. How old is the universe in years? About 10 to the 10th years. 10 to the 10th years, right. 10 to the 72 years is 10 to the 62 times bigger than the age of the universe, which is a huge number. So this is not something which is likely to have happened yet to any black hole that's present in the universe. But if the universe lasts long enough, and if the black hole stays there long enough, in that period of time, a solar mass black hole will degrade to the point that it is no longer a hologram. And at that point, at that point, if Alice des des decides to jump in, she's making a big mistake. She'll simply be eaten by the, uh, by the horizon and destroyed, at least if Polchinski and his friends are correct. I wanted to leave you with the message that this had all been cleaned up and solved. And if it had been three months ago, I would have left you with this message, that we now know that black holes are holograms, that the interior of the black holes are holographic images of what does on the surface. But, as I said, a new wrinkle has entered, and it's going to be sorted out. We don't know the answer for sure yet. But that's the challenge that's ahead of us to understand whether black holes age, whether there's an aging process that causes them to deteriorate. Well, that's the status now, and uh, that's the end of my lecture, too.
All right, the answer is sort of yes and no. Um, there's another parameter in string theory. It's called the coupling constant. And for a given value of the coupling constant, it's a strength of interaction between strings. The string fundamental length is always proportional to the Planck length. But as you change the coupling constant, the ratio between them changes somewhat. So it's possible to design a string theory in which the Planck length is much shorter than the string length. The typical situation is the Planck length and the string length are about the same. But um, it's possible to tune the ratio between them so that these little loops of string can be made much larger than the Planck length. Now, I'm not sure if that's the question you asked, I think. Uh, uh, and there is an interesting story there, but, uh, but uh, it's uh, a, little, a fairly technical story. So the answer, the answer is yes and no in the sense that if you know what the coupling constant is, uh, then the Planck length and the string length are in some fixed ratio. They're not exactly the same, but they're in some fixed ratio. But if you're allowed to change the coupling constant, which you are in string theory, then you can make the ratio grow to something very big so that the string wiggles can be much larger than the Planck length. Never smaller. Never smaller. Well, we're not so sure at the moment what happens there. <laughs> do you know if, at the singularity, no one seems to talk about what happens. Do you know if it goes to another dimension yeah. or if that's where there's it no, goes? Yeah, there's no evidence whatever that uh, falling into the singularity of a black hole does anything except destroy, except uh, be a place of infinite curvature and infinite um, tidal forces infinite ability to tear stuff apart. There is no evidence in anything that we've known up till now for the idea that when you fall into a black hole and come out uh, through the singularity, that you wind up in heaven or hell or any other place that, uh, that, um, that you might prefer to the singularity. So as far as we know, the answer is there's nothing magical about falling through uh, into the singularity and coming out someplace else. Uh, as I said, this, this subject is full of surprises, so we, but I believe that's uh, the status of it now. Does, does the ash have, does the ash have mass? All right, the question was, does the ash have mass? Ash, I believe you mean the products of evaporation. All right. Mostly the products of, ma of evaporation are massless, like photons, but they have energy. Now, the block, remember E equals mc squared, but this is subtle. Um, if E equals mc squared and photons have energy, they must have a mass. Well, that's not quite right. We use the term mass to mean rest mass. And a photon cannot be brought to rest. But an object made out of a lot of photons, for example, a box filled with photons that box will have a mass due to the energy of the photons inside. So the photons which get carried out carry off energy, and in that sense they carry off the energy of the black hole, which was the original mass of the black hole. So um, energy, I think, is the right thing to worry about and not mass. The energy of the photons that carry it off do have energy. Well, I'm not in charge of the. Uh, if, this. If, if the uh, universe is, is actually a hologram, what are the implications for time? Is oh, there, that. that, that <laughs> <laughs> um, beyond my pay grade. <laughs> no, this is this is one of the very interesting questions we're wrestling with. Um, uh, space seems to be constructed in this holographic manner, and it's an extremely interesting and 
rather unsettled question of whether time fits into things the same way. The, the answer is I'm not going to answer because I don't know. Uh, nor does anybody else at the present time. Uh, this, I, I think it should be clear, incidentally, that we're learning bits and fragments. It's rather remarkable about how much we have learned, but we have not put together a systematic, complete theory of quantum gravity. We are not even close to it. We've learned things by putting different, uh, different uh, principles together, by, uh, uh, by forcing things to work consistently, but we do not have a uh, comprehensive theory of either space, time, or anything else at the moment. So I'm working on it. Next time I'm back, I will give you the answer. <laughs> uh, it will be a young person who finds the answer, hopefully me. Doesn't the uh, deterioration of the horizon of the black hole result in a violation of your minus first law of physics? No, 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 no. No, the deterioration, <laughs> right, that's a good question. The deterioration of the horizon of the black hole is as a response to the emission of photons which carry off the information. So the, the point is something like this. If a black hole which is formed early, which has a nice horizon where everything is in place, has all the right properties, it's made out of a new piece of photo, photographic film, I don't really literally mean photographic film, uh, and you jump into it, your information will be stored on the surface of that black hole for a long period of time and it will uh, and then be emitted. The or or, in the other point of view, it will fall into the black hole and in this holographic form. After the black hole is deteriorated, there are not two pictures. There's only one picture. And the one picture is that the surface of the horizon of the black hole is a hot, dangerous place. Because it's hot and dangerous doesn't mean that the information is lost. It means it's basically bounced right back. And there is not the second picture of Alice sailing freely and smoothly through the horizon. So no, it does not mean that information is lost. It means that the interior of the black hole no longer has the capacity to hold anything. Yeah. So that is a very good question. And, uh, um, what I found remarkable about this last episode, I always knew that Physics comes in surprises. Things which you think are right and which everybody thinks are right, and uh, you know, long after uh, uh, there is agreement, surprises happen. And that's the pattern of, uh, uh, that physics has uh, had for, forever, for all the time. And so the answer is always expect surprises. But there's no way to expect surprises, because surprises by their very nature are surprises. No. Sur expect surprises is an oxymoron, but nevertheless, expect surprises. Somebody here, yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I apologize, I'm not a business, so I'm trying to express my question the best way I could. So let me start with this. Does black hole have a dimensionality? Does a black hole have a dimensionality? Yes. Um, it does have a dimensionality. From an information theory point of view, the capacity to hold a certain amount of information, one would say that the black hole is two-dimensional. The surface of the black hole is where the, where the information is stored. On the other hand, the black hole is an object which, uh, if you saw it uh, out there, you would say, oh my goodness, that's a three-dimensional uh, ball of some sort. So it's a little ambiguous. It's not ambiguous in any technical sense. It's ambiguous in the, in the English language sense. What do you mean by the dimensionality of the black hole? If you mean the capacity to store information, it behaves two-dimensionally. Uh, but is a hologram two-dimensional or three-dimensional? Exactly. That's what's going on here. Well, actually, the, the information is two-dimensional, 
but it's also three-dimensional. It's stored on a two-dimensional film, so it's two-dimensional. On the other hand, it represents three-dimensional stuff. So it's a little ambiguous. Not ambiguous, because, not ambiguous because we don't understand it, but ambiguous because the English language is a little too crude to, uh, to uh, describe the relation. Yeah. Okay. This is actually my real question is about, I'm concerned about the, the theory that, um, that scientists, I forgot his name, he mentioned that the information of a black hole equals to its area rather than its volume. Mm -hmm. And now let's imagine there's a wooden string. If you wrap it around to make it a wooden ball, and if you expand the wooden ball, the, the total surface area... This, this question area. sounds like it's getting technical <laughs> and hard. And one of the tricks of a person like myself is to say, this is a general audience here, and so I don't have to answer that. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's not like a ball of string. It's like string sort of wiggling around on the surface of a ball. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If you yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. But I think we can't resolve this uh, in real time. In uh, in uh, it's uh, uh, it's going to get technical. And, um, No hyper-technical questions. You said earlier that um, information is, is emitted from a black hole in the form of the photons and other particles that are talking radiation. Yeah. But I've heard from somewhere that it's really difficult to detect black hole because they don't... Um, okay. I'm not sure if it's because they well, being called black hole because they not even like to escape them. So why can't we detect them through the Hawking radiation? That yeah, 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 okay, good. All right. The answer is that the wavelength of the photons that are emitted from a black hole are proportional to the radius of the black hole. That means that the photons that come out of a one kilometer sized black hole, a stellar mass black hole, have a wavelength of about a kilometer. That means they're long wavelength radio waves. Furthermore, the number of photons that come out, I'm going to translate this in another way in a moment. The, the, the number of photons that come out per unit time is very, very sparse. You cannot measure or detect a very, very sparse collection of radio waves with any known technology. Another way to say it is that the temperature of the, the bigger the black hole, the colder the temperature. So if a black hole is solar mass, its temperature is about 10 to the minus 8th Kelvin. Now, the surroundings of the black hole are much warmer than that. Three degrees, that's the uh, cosmic microwave background. So the surroundings are much colder in the real world sorry, are much hotter, much warmer than the black hole itself. What happens, does heat go under those circumstances from the environment into the black hole or from the black hole into the environment? Well, heat always goes from the warmer to the colder. So the warmer is the environment, the black hole is the colder, and the heat photons are going into the black hole. This kind of evaporation will only happen after the universe has expanded so much that the temperature of the universe becomes smaller than the temperature of the black hole. And that's going to be a long time, a trillion years or something like that. So, no, we, can't, uh, we cannot detect an object which is 10 to the minus, by, by looking at the radiation from it, which, is, which has a temperature of 10 to the minus 8th Kelvin. Uh, it's just quite impossible. If we wait, if we're willing to wait a trillion years, and over that period of time, if we construct detectors which can detect single photons of radio wavelength, we'll be able to do it then. But uh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> uh, my question would be, how would the 
can't hear. Can't. How do you define the information? Because your, your book contains a lot of information, <laughs> and it's made of uh, letters. And now yes, 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 there's a zillion different definitions of information, but the con you're a physicist, right? Okay, good. So, the conservation of information is. E I'm going to. I'm going to give you a technical answer. The conservation of information, everybody agrees on what it means. So I will tell you. In classical mechanics, it means Liouville's theorem. It means that the size of a region of phase space is conserved with time so that the number of dis distinctions, but in quantum mechanics, it means the unitarity of the time development. The unitarity of the time development is the thing which tells you that distinctions are preserved with time. That's what it means. The technical meaning is unitarity in quantum mechanics and what's called Liouville's theorem in classical mechanics. All physicists will agree that those two things are correct and that they constitute some concept of conservation of distinctions. Two things which are different in the beginning will always remain different forever and ever. And it's coded in quantum mechanics by unitarity, in classical mechanics by Liouville's theorem. Now, I, I, I appreciate that, uh, that most of the audience has no idea what I'm talking about, but you're a physicist, and so I think you do. I hope. I think I, I'm sure you do. Yours in charge. No, 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 no. I, uh, but uh, there was a gentleman over here who has, yeah, there he is. He's had his hand up for a long time. And, uh... Uh, is there a transition state between the point where the black hole can store information and when it can't? Yeah. Because yeah. you said that... Yeah, it's not an absolutely sharp transition, but it's a fairly sharp transition. It's called the page time. And it's the time after which half of the entropy of the black hole has been radiated out into the form of uh, Hawking radiation. It's the time when there is more information in the Hawking radiation than there is in the leftover black hole. It's called the page time after the physicist on page. And it is the point at which the black hole horizon has really deteriorated to the point where it can, where the hologram can no longer store information. <coughs> so there, and it's a fairly sharp transition. So if you entered at that point, what would happen? Right at that point? No, bad idea. Even if you entered a little before that, it would be a bad idea because the capacity to describe the interior would be highly degraded by that point, uh, but not completely ruined. It would be like having a very bad hologram uh, shortly before. And so the image on the other side of the horizon would be highly distorted, deformed, corrupted, and so forth. Uh, and then, yeah, there is a, but that is a fairly sharp transition between um, good ability to store information and inability. So, yeah, and uh, there's no name for that transition yet, but the time is called the page time. Incidentally, as I said, for a solar mass black hole, that would be about 10 to the 72 years, so it's a long time. Just a curious question. Uh, according to one minus one, mm -hmm. Alice is feeling very good inside the black hole, right? Until she hits the singularity. I feel good myself, too. Where? I don't feel so good. <laughs> Wait, say so you're asking what if, if you feel good? Yeah. I I don't know. Do you? <laughs> what the, what the, I missed I missed the thrust of the question. According to law minus one. Yeah. Alice going into the hole feels good. And feel good. Yeah. And where we are in a black hole or outside? Ah. You're asking, are we in a black hole? Yes. The answer is we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. There's no way to know. It's a very curious fact. If there were a shell of material falling in with close to the speed of light, and it hadn't gotten to us yet, 
because light could not have gotten to us yet from that shell, uh, we don't, there's no way to know if that shell is actually falling in. It's coming in, it's coming in, it's coming in, but it's coming in close to the speed of light. We won't know it until it hits us. On the other hand, surprisingly, the horizon of the black hole forms long before the shell arrives at the center. So we cannot tell whether we're in a black hole or not. Now, most cosmologists would say, well, there's no, uh, we don't think there's any reason to believe there's a big shell of infalling matter. There's no reason in current cosmology to think anything like that is true. But the fact is that there's no experimental way to say whether we're inside a black hole or not. Yeah. Your wife is in the black hole. <laughs> yeah, I, I can assure you that you are not inside and she is outside. That, that I think we can be, I think they're going to be fairly sure of that. Hmm? I will try to deliver the message. Okay. Good. I, I think the current understanding is that she is simply terminated, or any piece of her body which crosses the horizon is simply terminated and then emitted as Hawking radiation. So I think it's fair to say she doesn't experience anything. Uh, her experience is simply terminated. She gets no warning. It's not as if there was heat coming out of the black hole which roasts her before she gets there. Now, I, I, I assure you, I'm not making this up. But it is uh, the current state of understanding among a handful of people who've really thought about this that that's what it looks like. That's the, that looks like where it's going, that, uh, that there's a, a sharp edge to the black hole, the end of space, so to speak, and uh, that it simply terminates things. Terminates, but does emit the bits as uh, radiation. Uh, Mm, mm, that's a wonderful question. Okay, so, right. We live in a universe that has a horizon. It's an outer horizon. It's an outer horizon. This has to do with dark energy and accelerated expansion and all that sort of stuff. But from what we know about that, it's as if we're in an inside-out black hole. The inside-out black hole uh, is we're on the inside and things fall out through a horizon. It's called a cosmic horizon. It's a little different than a black hole. But the question is whether our cosmic horizon has degraded and whether it has... Uh, um, if you plug in numbers... Now, nobody understands too much about this. This is, this is quite well beyond the, not only my pay grade but, uh, but just everybody's. Nobody understands too much about exactly that question. But if you just plug in numbers and you ask how long would it take for, the, uh, for this inside-out black hole to degrade? It's far, 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 far longer than this 10 to the 72 years. I, I've, oh, God, um, I, I, I can work it out, but it would take, a long, take some time. Um, uh, 10 to the 85 years, I think, I don't remember. But the point is, according to the current state of knowledge, there is no reason to think that, our, that the horizon at our boundary has degraded. The horizon at our boundary would be like the hologram out there that, uh, that's uh, describing the interior. So, uh, look, it better not be that, uh, that uh, it would not be a good thing for us if our uh, hologram out there had degraded. And, uh, so, uh, but I must say, that is one of the questions that people are thinking about. Uh, Please help me thank Dr. Good. Thank you.